Hi, I'm Vinny Tolman, and this is my crossover experience. Back in 2003, I was found dead in a public restroom. I was pronounced dead by a medical team who found me or was called after I was found. Again, my body was taken in a body bag to be turned into a medical examiner. And while it was being taken on the route to the medical examiner, one of the medics, a brand new medic, a rookie, he was sitting in the back of the ambulance. He felt prompting. He felt what he told me was just a knowing that something else was going on and he wanted to try to resuscitate this body. He went ahead, he opened that body bag, he uh, felt around for any sign of life, he didn't feel anything. As he kept feeling for any sign of life, he did feel some type of shock, some type of electricity. And when he felt that, he felt that was enough of a sign for him that he was going to go ahead and break protocol and try to attempt resuscitation with this body. He went ahead and got oxygen fed into the lungs. After that, he followed with hooking the body up to a machine that shocks the heart and ignites life in the heart or, or turns the heart on, uh, gets the heart started back up. And there was no result with the first round of shock. The second round of shock, um, the heart did have one heartbeat. And at the third round of shock, the heart started again. Meanwhile, this whole time, I was watching all of this from above. I had witnessed them bagging the body. I witnessed them putting the body in the back of the ambulance. I witnessed this rookie medic get the message that this one's not dead. And he took action on that and he was able to get the heart to come back. And one of the miracles of all of this is it all happened a half of a block away from a hospital. The route that they were driving to turn the body in it led them right in front of a hospital right when the heart started. They were able to immediately divert uh, the ambulance into the hospital and get the body turned into the different medical teams that were there to meet them and begin the process, the long process of treating this body and helping it come back to life. There was quite a bit of problems. My body had aspirated, so I had choked i had suffocated that's what had killed me that's uh what ended up killing me in that bathroom i had passed out and threw up and so there was a lot of work they had to do to bring this body back including evacuate the lungs with the vomit that was there and also get all sorts of of treatments done for the blood uh, the body had been dead for well over 45 minutes, maybe close to an hour and a half, but documented at least 45 minutes. And this was a process. As I'm witnessing all of this, I didn't know that what I was watching was my own death. I didn't think that that was possible. How could someone witness your own death? To me, I felt I was watching some type of interactive entertainment or some type of show or movie. I didn't feel this was something tangible or real for me because me was up above this whole scene and I was watching from above. But as they, they transferred the body from the medical gurney on the ambulance into the medical gurney at the hospital, so from bed to bed, as they were transferring, I saw them strapping the body down because the body was going into full seizures. And that's when I felt someone strapping my arm. And I looked down at my left arm. I felt as if someone was strapping my left arm where I was sitting watching things. And when I did look down, I could see the left arm of the body, but I could see it up close like it was right up near me. And that was the first reckoning that I had that everything I'd been witnessing was my own death. As I witnessed or, or recognized that what I was witnessing was my own death, I had a tremendous sense of fear come into me, and I felt as if I was one of the most ignorant people to ever exist. I was sitting there watching my own death, and I had no idea. I believed I was watching something like entertainment, and yet here it was, I was watching my own death. And I had the thought, how could I be so dumb that I didn't know that I was dead, that I didn't know that I just witnessed my own death? 
And as I had that thought, I started to see anything negative that I ever did in my life, anything. I saw it from my own perspective, but also the perspective of those around me. I witnessed everything bad, including things I did as a small child. I started to believe and feel that maybe I wasn't worth existing because I did have so many bad things around me. That's when I started to feel this warmth, beautiful warmth. And it came over me. It just started to warm me from behind. It started in my back area and just started to warm all over my shoulders and my, my head. And then I started to see all the good that I ever did. I saw it from my perspective and the perspective of those around me. And I saw that I did far more good for far more years than I did do anything that was bad or not good. As I witnessed all of these good things that I did, I had this thought that yes, I am worth existing. I am worth being here. I am worth being alive. And as that warmth continued to overtake me, I recognized that the warmth was directionally coming from behind me. So I turned around. I turned around to see where this warmth was coming from. It felt so peaceful and it felt so healing. And as soon as I turned around, I see this, this man standing there just majestic and strong, but with this face just full of love. And he was smiling at me. And the, the first thought I had was, you must be God. And you know, he had long white hair. He had a long white beard. I thought this is, must be what God looks like. And as soon as I had that thought, I actually received a message from him. Without him using his mouth or speaking, he told me, no, son, I'm not God. And my follow-up thoughts was you must be Jesus then. If you're not God, then are you Jesus? Is, is that somehow possible that you're Jesus? And he again smiled and just said, no, son, I'm not Jesus. He said, I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here to be your guide. You can call me Drake. He explained that his friends and, and those who cared about him call him Drake, and that I could go wherever I wanted to go in the universe, anywhere and that he would help me go there. He would help me bring whoever or whatever I was at this point to wherever I wanted to go. And I knew that this love, this tremendous amount of warmth was coming from him. And so I asked him, I said, where, where is this coming from? This love that I'm feeling coming from you, where is that coming from? And he explained that it was coming from my home, that that's where I originally came from, and that's where he came from. And he would love to take me there if I wanted to go. And at that moment, he motioned back to my body and, and said, or I can, I can take you back to your body. I looked back at my body. I saw the hell that was going on there. There was a guy straddling the body, like sitting on top of him, trying to, I think, feed a tube into the lungs or something. I couldn't see that part, but I could see him straddling the body. And I knew. I didn't want anything to do with that. I wanted to go towards this love energy that Drake was showing me. And so I instantly said, I want to go with you. I want to go home. He helped me ex understand. He helped explain to me that this journey was going to be an important journey, a journey of distance and time and understanding. But most importantly, it was going to be a journey of love energy the energy of love that I am able to hold in my soul. And that as I could hold more of this love energy, I could continue to go with him. I really believed. I told him, I said, Drake, I am Christian. I was raised Christian. I am active Christian. I, I feel that I can just go in that special door for Christians, that special place. And Drake just looked at me with so much love. And he explained, said, I love that you feel like that, Vinny, but there's a lot more that we need to help you through for you to go there and get to this place, to our home. So he began to help me understand these different principles I did have to embody. Now, I didn't have to fully accept or embrace these principles. All I had to do was be willing to accept that they were possible. And as long as I was be willing to accept them as possibilities, then I was able to move towards our destination of home 
or heaven. So the first thing he taught me was about authenticity, that in this life, most of us are not authentic. Most of us, after we turn five or six years old, we become less and less authentic every year until we become almost 85 years old. Then we become authentic again. And for some reason, we think that we are preventing vulnerability by not being authentic. And Drake showed me that for us to truly grow in this life, we have to be authentic everywhere we go. And that means being vulnerable. That means being honest and being integrous with what we do. And that that was the most important thing for me is to understand that authenticity is paramount and the foundation of growth. That until I could be authentic, I couldn't even know who I really was. So he helped me. He helped me see all the different masks and faces that I carried. And he helped me peel them away and, and become the core of who I was. So that I could be the same person, no matter who I was going to see or be with, that I could be the same Vinny or the same me, no matter where I went, whether I was at work or I was at church or I was with friends or with family, I could be the same person, the same being. And that's when he helped me understand the second principle, which is the purpose of life. And he explained that that purpose of life is that we're here coming to earth to what he called an earth school classroom, a place where we come to learn, to grow, to make choices, and to build, build relationships, build understandings, build abilities, build skills, build um, our ability to embrace life and embrace each other through this life. And that this earth school is just that. It's a classroom. It's a school. And it never was a courtroom that we're here to learn, to grow, and to build essentially the content of our character, build our ability to build relationships and to love each other and serve each other. And that's when he helped me understand the third principle. The third principle is loving everyone. That as I learned why I'm here on earth, I could also learn how to love everyone. And that as I love everyone, I love all beings, I'm able to love God, love the Creator. And that until I could love all of creation, I couldn't truly love the creator. To love the creator, you must love the creations, all of them. That was a new one for me. That helped me learn or step towards the fourth principle is listening to my inner voice, recognizing that I did have an inner voice. I listened to it here and there. He showed me the times that I listened to my inner voice. He also showed me times in my life that I didn't listen to my inner voice and what happened when I didn't. Some of us might call that inner voice our conscience. Some of us might call it our instinct or our intuition. It doesn't change that it's there. But all of us, every single one of us, no matter what culture we were born into, no matter what environment we grow up in, we have that intuition. We have that inner voice, and it's important for us to listen to the inner voice. And when we have questions in life, to not seek all of our answers in the world, to seek God, seek our Creator for those answers. And those answers will come through the inner voice. And too many times, we turn directly towards our phones or we turn towards the web for everything, for all of our solutions. And our ancestors, who had quite a bit of enlightenment themselves, some of them, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have Google. They found their answers from the inner voice. And some of life's greatest solutions and some of life's greatest options are not going to be found on Google. They're not going to be found on on the web. They'll be found by plugging in to the creator, plugging into that inner voice that all of us get access to, all of us have if we allow ourselves to listen. But we do have to listen and learn how to listen to our own inner voice. That is what brought me to the fourth principle or fifth principle, which is using technology responsibly. That technology can either help us and strengthen that relationship with our soul, with our spirit, with our creator, or it can tear it apart. It can separate us. It can put us apart from our creator. 
that using technology, it can either, you know, strengthen or weaken our connection with God. And that as I use my own technology responsibly, I can build that strong relationship with my creator so that I recognize my intuition. I recognize the solutions coming from my creator. That led me to the sixth principle, which was release all prejudice. That as I can use technology responsibly, the next step beyond that is to embrace an energy of no prejudice or full embracing of all people, all beings. And I grew up in a a multiracial family. I felt I didn't have any prejudice whatsoever. That's when Drake showed me that I did have prejudice, but it was for prejudiced people. And that by me having prejudice towards prejudiced people, I was joining their team. I myself was becoming prejudiced. That on my own path of enlightenment, my own path of growth and progress, I had to really love all beings, including those who are prejudiced. And if I could do that, I could embody the love that is coming constantly from heaven, from our home. And that was this love that I was following on my journey. And that, you know, releasing prejudice was a big deal because it's, as you can do that, I moved on to step seven or my seventh principle that I learned, which is understanding the power of creation, that as we can release our prejudice, we are now opening up our mind to have the keys to the universe handed to us. And the keys to the universe are our thoughts, because our thoughts become our beliefs. Our beliefs lead to our actions. Our action, our actions add up to be our, our character. And our character becomes the driver of our destiny. But it all starts with our thoughts. We've got to learn how to use the power of creation by controlling our thoughts, by embracing the positive thoughts and avoiding the negative thoughts. And that led me to the the eighth principle, which is avoid negative influences. Because if our thoughts are the power of creation, how important it is for us to make sure that we are turning towards the positive thoughts, embracing and attracting positive things through positive thoughts. And if we can control our thoughts, we can control our outcomes eventually. The key is to hold the positive thoughts forever. And as we do, our life goes in a positive direction eventually and keeps that trajectory as long as we can keep those positive thoughts constantly happening. And that, that you know, allowed me to understand that as we can avoid those negative influences, we can avoid the big pitfalls in this life. And then in this life, there really is only two religions. Amongst all of our religions, there is love and there is that you can be in any type of faith and you can be motivated by love or you can be motivated by fear. If we're motivated by fear, we tend to bring negative outcomes to our actions. But when we're motivated by love, we tend to bring positive outcomes to our actions. That's when I learned the ninth principle. The ninth principle is that there is purpose, even to evil, as there is purpose in good. And the purpose of of good and evil is so that we have a choice. And as important as the choice of good is, so is there important to be a choice of evil so that we have that choice to grow. And if you eliminate the evil choice or the bad choice, the mistake choice, you eliminate the opportunity to grow. But yes, there is purpose even in the evil on this planet. Every time you have any type of evil happening on this planet, the corrective energy to that evil is so much light, so much love that it counterbalances any of that energy that is originally placed. And it's vitally important for us to have both so that we can have that choice. Because if you do remove the choice, you remove the opportunity to grow. It's through making those choices that we grow the most. Sometimes even making a mistake can lead to growth. If we learn from it, we're able to grow from it and move on and make better choices. That led me to the 10th principle to understand that every single one of us are all part of God's creation. 
We're all one. We are all fingers on God's hands, every single one of us. That as we love or serve another, we love and we serve our Creator. As we hate or as we harm another, we hate or we harm our Creator. And that if we want to really embody the love that is our Creator, God, then we have to learn how to love each other and put away the differences or honor and love and recognize them, but to not let them be a reason that we hurt each other harm each other, that we learn to love each other because of our differences. It's through that love that we unify all the fingers on God's hands to come together in strength. And as I went through that last energy of understanding that we are all one, that as I serve others, I'm serving God, I actually started to see heaven, the real place, and it is a very real place. It's much larger than this planet here of Earth much larger, like just not even close. You could put many earths across the inside of this place, many, many earths, countless. This heaven space is a planet. And as we were going towards this planet space, as we got closer and closer, I recognized that light was coming from the planet itself. Light was not coming from outside sources. It was coming from heaven as a planet. As I touched down, we actually touched down on this heaven space, my toes went down into what felt like grass. That's when I realized that I still had my body. It just was not a physical body. It was an energetic body. And in that state, it felt more physical than my body on earth. It felt vibrant and full of love and force and fierceness. And as my toes went down and touched the grass, I could feel that the grass came up and it unified with me. I could feel that the grass itself had a smell and a taste. And I was experiencing even the taste of the grass through my feet, through my energetic feet. And I could feel that this grass had a, a supreme intelligence. It had a light, a love, and a consciousness coming from it. I could feel that every single blade of grass had a consciousness as well as the grouping of the grass had a consciousness could feel the love of my creator from just the grass. And as I just sat there and I was embracing this moment, I felt this recharging going on in my being as if I was always meant to be touching this grass and now getting there. I felt I was finally home. I was finally where I always wanted to be, but I didn't know why. I didn't know why I wanted to be there until I touched down. And as soon as I plugged into that grass, I just felt home. I could actually hear like music, this very light music. And I knew it was coming from the grass. And as I looked at the grass itself, there was actually waves of light, all sorts of waves of light, many, many colors coming off of the grass. And it felt like the grass itself was singing and it was singing love praises. Love praises for me, love praises for Drake, my guide, love praises for the creator. I could feel all this love just from the simple grass. I could also feel the roots of the grass, how they connected to all the other grass and all the other creations and how the love that it was plugged into is so vitally important and so powerful, extremely powerful. It felt like my light was getting brighter by just plugging into this grass. And that's when Drake came close to me and said, Vinny, if you like the grass, you should see the flowers. And that's when I, <laughs> I had my own little freak out moment. I was like, there's flowers. What? There's flowers? And the very moment I had that thought, oh, wow, there's flowers. Drake took my consciousness and he took it from where I was in my energetic body. And he put my consciousness instantly on a flower, like on the petals of a flower, almost like I was the size of a bee, like I was tiny and I was, I was on this flower. And then I got to experience just the velvety feeling of, of the touch and feel of this flower and to feel the aroma and the music the sweetness, even sweeter than the grass coming off of this flower, and to feel that this flower loved me, 
loved me specifically and this flower loved our creator and how together by me even experiencing this flower i knew i loved my creator even more just by experiencing this flower as i was sitting there just trying to take this all in the greens and the reds the yellows the, the oranges just millions of colors we don't have here they're all there so many colors that we can't even perceive exist there and i'm just taking this all in as i take it all in then then drake says hey you know there let me show you the trees there's trees over here and i i just i almost couldn't take it i was like there's trees i then began to connect plug into the trees supreme wisdom and dignity of the trees the solemnness of the trees i could feel the great consciousness or higher consciousness just in the trees i could feel that connection to god our creator through all of these things and that's when i felt the energy of the water drake explained that there was a water and the water came to me it came to my feet first and it asked me do you want us on you and i said yes i do and the water came up first over my toes then over my ankles up my legs up over my whole body and as it closed in over the top of my body i could feel that everywhere that that water touched everywhere that that water touched there was healing taking place i could feel generations of healing taking place with this water. And for the first time, I started to get this semblance or understanding that when we baptize or we do immersion by water on earth, that we're copying a very sacred thing that we get to experience in heaven, that the waters, they will go over us and they will heal us of the worst trauma that this life can give us. And I had a very traumatic childhood on the extremes and going through that i needed that healing that healing became profound for me that healing allowed me to come back when it was time for me to come back as a different person and that water sealed the deal it all started with the grass the flowers and the trees and as the water was receding off of me it completed it finished its job its duty its love its service as it receded off of me, I then noticed a building, a beautiful building. And I just somehow know that that building was a university. It was a place of learning. And there, there was no sign needed. You just knew it was a place of learning. I also knew that people could not go in and out of the rooms there unless they matched the frequency or the love energy of the room. And as they could match the love energy, they could get in and they could actually learn in each room. But the first thing I could pick up from that building is it was built out of one piece of marble. And it was huge. And this, this marble was living. It was flowing. Every spot of it was glowing light and radiating this love that everything had in heaven. And this love was just oscillating and vibrating and radiating off of everything. And that's when I, I felt the intention that I wanted to go into that university. I wanted to go learn. I wanted to learn more about the universe. And I knew that if you go in this place, you could learn actual facts and not his story or history. You would learn actual facts, true facts, unadulterated, absolute truths. And as I had that intention, that's when Drake came around to my side. He put his arm around me and he said, Vinny, this is going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And that's when he gave me the greatest gift of my experience. He gave me a hug of truly unconditional love, of love that I could never deserve. If I di did everything perfectly in my life, I still couldn't deserve this hug. He gave me this hug. As he did, our, our, the energy of both of us came together and became one for a moment. And as we became one in this hug, I could feel the amplification of the two of us coming together and blasting off of us. It felt like what I would imagine a pulsar or a great explosion of energy. 
And with this great explosion of energy, I could feel the leveling up, the magnification of my own energy just by going into this hug. And if any of us could even know that we have a hug like that waiting for us in heaven, we would live our life completely different. If we could even see the grass there and just a single blade of grass even, to know it, to see it, to experience it, we would live our lives completely differently. Because that space, that heavenly realm, is so full of this unconditional love. And in this, this world, everything is so conditional. We tend to think that God must be conditional, but our Creator is not conditional in any way. Our Creator loves every single one of us. And as I was feeling the embodiment of this unconditional love, I started to hear a prayer, a special prayer that my brother was giving to my body. Meanwhile, I was dead, I was found, I was revived, my body alive, but my brain was still dead for three days. And during those three days, I was having my heaven experience. I was on my journey and in heaven experiencing the real world, the real existence, not the virtual reality, not the mortal experience, but the real experience of life. And as I was there, my brother was praying over my body every day. This third night that I was in the hospital and I was brain dead, he felt very motivated to say an, an earnest prayer, a prayer of love over my body. And he commanded my body to be made whole and to be healed. He commanded my consciousness to come back and for me to wake up. And that's not going to work for everybody, but it worked for me. I felt as if when my brother stopped the prayer, I felt that I woke up as soon as he had completed it. And in real world terms, my brother had said that, that prayer over me at 10 p.m., around 10 p.m., and I woke up at 1.11 in the morning. And when I woke up, I felt fine. I felt like nothing was wrong, except for I was extremely claustrophobic. And one of the reasons I was so claustrophobic is I realized that our souls, our spirit, are so much larger than our bodies. And that to come back into the body is very hard for the spirit to do. That's why most spirits only come into the body as babies, so that we can ride out that process gradually as we come into this realm. I came in like that. I woke up. I found that I was on full life support. I yanked everything off of me. I yanked the tubes, the pipes, the sensors, the IVs, the catheter, everything. I yanked it off of me. I pulled it out of me, everything. I couldn't even have a hospital gown touching me. I stood there naked in my room, just panting and breathing, trying to breathe. I felt I was so short of breath in the beginning. And then I decided I needed to get out of there. I rifled around in the cabinets. I found some new hospital gowns that were stacked in there. I wrapped them around my midsection. And then I took off. I wanted to leave. I wanted to go home. I made it all the way to the elevator when I heard a scream. There was a nurse that had gone in my room to see what had happened. All of the alarms and sensors were going off. So she went in to go answer those alarms and saw that there was no body. And to her, I was a vegetable. I was in a coma. So there was no chance of me coming out. And to see that, that I wasn't there, she initially screamed. And then she called for another nurse. The other nurse came in. She ended up screaming when they both walked out of the room and saw me. And I knew they were going to get in trouble or some type of trouble if I didn't come back to my room. I also knew I would probably be prevented from leaving even if I made it down the bottom floor. But I ended up going back to the room, begging these nurses to let me go home. And they promised me as long as I could pass some, some preliminary tests that eventually I'd be able to go home. And six hours later, and a whole battery of tests, so many tests, and signing about a phone book worth of paperwork, I was able to self-release out of the hospital. And I left that hospital at 7.30 that, that same morning. And that's where my story takes a little bit of a, a twist. Is in the beginning, I thought that I was possibly delusional. I thought that maybe my 
my brain had just made up all of these memories. And I thought that for a while. I thought it was definitely a possibility, a likely possibility, because none of it was making sense. But then I met my angel. I met my Andrea. She was my heaven on earth and is my heaven on earth. She was able to help me see heaven and the light of heaven through her eyes, through her demeanor, through her actions. And it helped awaken a desire to live and to keep living. And, you know, as I got closer and closer to her and we got engaged, I ended up going to a little town in Wyoming to a reunion, a family reunion. And I saw a history presentation on the town of Afton, Wyoming, in the Star Valley area. I was watching this presentation and up comes a picture of Drake and it was larger than life up on the big screen. But the confusing point was it said his name was Charles. It didn't say his name was Drake, but I recognized his last name. It was the same last name as my grandmother before she got married. So we went directly there. Me and Andrea, we went directly to my grandmother's house and I asked her, I said, Grandma, Tell me about this Charles Kazare. I want to know about Charles Kazare. Tell me everything you know. And her exact response was, oh, you mean great grandpa Drake. He's kind of famous in our family. And at that moment, I just lost it for a minute because now this whole experience, it wasn't some delusion. It wasn't some oxygen deprived, imaginative event. It was now a real person a real person from my own heritage that I knew nothing about. He was my great, great, great grandfather on my grandmother's side. And there's no possible way I could have even known the name he went by to his friends and family. Because on all official things, he's known as Charles. But yet to his friends and family, they all called him by his middle name, which was Drake. To me, it was a sweet confirmation that what I was experiencing was outside what normal reality is. And it's hard to understand. It's hard to explain. I don't share it to prove anything to anybody. The reason I share this is to help people understand that our life here is far more complex than we can know. That our life here has effects forwards and backwards beyond our realm of comprehension. That our life here is vitally important to us, eternally, and that we live for an eternity before we get to earth school, and we live for an eternity after earth school. But yet, we come to this place for about a hundred years or less, and why? So that we can learn, so we can learn how to love, to learn how to build relationships, and to create things, create using our thoughts, build a beautiful life for ourselves. And that's what I do. I am actually Day to day, every day, I work with people and I help them do that in their own lives. I help people get that personal connection with their creator. And I promise you, our creator doesn't care what name you use. Our creator only cares that you're reaching and you want to connect. Our creator wants to connect with you, each and every one of you, even if you don't want to believe. It doesn't matter. It still wants to connect. And that's my experience. That's my story.